Hello, I am Dr. Lauren Apter Barron's father, director of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. The Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh connects the horrors of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism with injustices of today. Through education, the Holocaust Center empowers individuals to build a more civil and humane society. In April, 2020, we launched a month of programs for genocide awareness in partnership with the organization Together We Remember. The first event was held April 5th, 2020. Originally envisioned as an in-person gathering at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center in downtown Pittsburgh, it became a virtual gathering, which featured a panel of experts on the Holocaust, genocide, atrocity prevention, and trauma-informed community building. We left the panel discussion committed to reconnecting with each of the panelists. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the series of follow-up conversations, where we will ask the questions we received during the Q&A on April 5th. We will learn more about each of our panelists, and we will continue to explore the question, what does never again mean to you? I invite you to continue the conversation on Facebook during and after each broadcast. Thank you for joining us today. Together, we can turn memory into action. Maybe, so maybe we'll start now with what we present to the public. And I think this is probably a good place to start is to think mm -hmm. about um, the impact of COVID-19 specifically in this moment, um, how it is changing um, our lives, but also uh, the dangers that this sort of, sort of situation presents for increased <laughs> violence, hatred, et cetera. Might ask you to reflect on that. Yeah, I think that uh, that this is certainly a significant worry, and there's definitely a connection between disease, uh, hunger, genocide, and atrocity. And this could be one of those questions that if we let it go, could be the entire length of time for us to talk about. But I think that if nothing else, what the COVID uh, pandemic has shown us is the importance of thinking about prevention and uh, thinking about the importance of early warning of proactive action mm -hmm. as opposed to reactive action. And that's what a lot of us who have been working in atrocity prevention for years have been arguing. It's a very hard sell, as you well know, to convince people that they need to take action preventatively. The payoffs are not obvious. It's hard to clearly demonstrate you have stopped something that otherwise would have happened if it never actually happens. Right. And we're not structured or incentivized in ways to reward that kind of action. But if you wait until there's widespread violence, like in a place like Syria, you know that there's far fewer courses of action that you can take, that the options are far more costly and far more long-term. And much of the scholarship on this shows that they're largely ineffective and potentially if you intervene militarily, you have the possibility of exacerbating the conflict rather than, than solving it. And so the problem wow. that I think we see uh, with the intervention in terms of how do you prevent atrocity uh, and the lessons from COVID are, are similar in that I don't mean this in a way that would be in any way diminishing the experience, but I'm going to use what I call the toothbrush analogy to kind of explain why um, anywhere where there's ongoing mass atrocities or genocides, that it's worthwhile thinking about prevention. So we all brush our teeth. Uh, why do we do that? Because we, the pain of getting a cavity, the the long-term harm of losing teeth or getting uh, mouth disease is significant. We don't wait until we've developed cavities to start brushing our teeth. We brush our teeth in advance of that, and we work to prevent those kinds of things. And that's how we have to think about atrocity prevention. And uh, in relation to, to COVID in particular, uh, and the hunger and other disease that this exacerbates, the, there are a series of ways of thinking about this, primarily in terms of long-term risk factors or underlying causes, and then short-term triggers or catalysts. And hunger and disease like COVID need not be catalysts, but they, they could
could be. And the biggest risk in my mind that COVID actually presents is in the Southern Hemisphere and the Global South. Uh, those There are countries in the Global North, of course, where emergency powers have been exploited. Uh, Hungary is an example where there's a movement that's, a, that's continuing a trend that we saw before COVID of movement back towards authoritarian regimes. And there are some prediction models that definitely claim that there's a correlation between authoritarian regimes and risk of atrocity. But any scholar knows whether or not you, uh, you believe that theory, that there, are, if you've studied the failure of democracy in Weimar Germany, you know the dangers of putting aside checks and balances in emergency situations. And so any student of the Holocaust should be, uh, or any student actually should be, nervous about some of these trends. But in the global south in particular, I think the, the, the risks are even more dramatic. Uh, the Auschwitz Institute for the Prevention of uh, Genocide and Mass Atrocity just put out a joint letter from a, a scores of, uh, of associated organizations, mostly NGOs uh, and atrocity prevention groups, urging governments to kind of take uh, prevention seriously. The problem of governance is the thing that I think I worry about most when it comes to the impact of COVID, that in areas where governance is weak or ineffective, uh, where there's not much funding or there aren't strong administrative structures, the impact of, uh, of COVID could be tsunami-like. And what I mean by that is it was is going to place extraordinary pressure on those institutions to to take care of their people, and many of them don't have the capacity to do so. And when they don't have the capacity or when other parts of the society, of civil society, are sidelined, in whether it's because of ongoing conflict or because of some uh, because of COVID, for example. COVID is sidelining organizations that normally would be out doing grassroots work with people. Uh, and when those things are not able to happen and you can't provide aid and support and government governance systems collapse, that's when, and, or get overwhelmed, if you have fragile healthcare systems and they simply can't uh, compensate for all of the the, the victims of COVID, for example. I mean, we were overwhelmed here in New York Imagine what it would be like in a um, in a lesser developed country with far fewer doctors, far fewer clinics, far less ability, perhaps no ventilators. Uh, this is not only does it produce long term harm, but it also potentially produces some form of lack of trust in governance. Because if government can't solve your problem, why would they be able to solve future problems? That combined with the threat of famine, which it already exists in many places, particularly if subsistence farmers who need to work every day are not able to subsist, then that's when you get people moving towards more radical solutions and, and violence and perhaps non-scientific answers to, their, um, to these types of questions that they're seeking answers for. Uh, you have something we've seen in this country already. You have people who then will be targeted as the blame group, scapegoat, for, uh, for why the situation is affecting them. And so you see it here in the United States with Asians. You see even anti-Semitism on the uptick, mm -hmm. um, exacerbated by COVID. You see in some of these liberty rallies, there have been anti-Semites who have also been part of those rallies. They've ne not necessarily been the only ones there, but they're there. Uh, and you see in India, for example, the, the clear blaming of Muslims as the reason for COVID. And these sorts of risks are, are things that we're very concerned about. The splits between the haves and the have-nots, uh, we've seen that in this country. And it will be worse in countries where you have an even greater division of power between those in power who have access to health care and those who don't. Uh, and I could go on. <laughs> there are many, many of these kinds of worries uh, about triggers and risks and long-term harm that COVID could cause. Uh, the, the one area that I'm particularly concerned about is East Africa. Uh, right now, they are in the midst of famine, and they happen to also be experiencing a massive 
uh, locust infestation. Uh, locusts eat an enormous amount, and the combination of fewer people farming, of the inability to actually combat the locusts, uh, and loss of food as a result of that could cause real devastation in um, in much of East Africa. So we're not talking about a state like Somalia. We're talking about 10, 12 states, uh, all of whom could be deep in famine by the time we get to the end of the summer. The other thing that's been really striking to me is how COVID-19 is revealing structural inequities that existed in this country, too. So mm -hmm. we... As, as your response spoke to problems that pre-existed COVID-19 and the spread of this virus that has changed all of our lives, we're seeing probably in, in each community in the United States that the people who were already less likely to be able to access health care or already had disparate health outcomes are now having those disparate health outcomes with COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think any time you have one of these uh, triggering factors, it brings the structural problems to uh, to the surface, and you you then see them more clearly. And we're certainly seeing that in in our country. There is the uh, potential in any time you have one of these emerging situations to to move towards greater polar polarization or to uh, to basically actively resist that. And I think that the easier direction um, is to marshal your resources for your group and move towards protecting, quote, your own, right? And to hardening those lines between us and them and the, mm -hmm. those who have and those who, who don't. Uh, that's why prevention is so difficult. And that's why atrocity prevention is so important is because we need those NGOs. We need those organizations. We need people in government to take those lessons and to um, and put them in practice so that essentially we don't have a polarized slope. Right. So we had one question that is directly connected to this. What we've been talking about is um, not particularly optimistic. I mean, we're talking about a lot of problems and I'm taking preventative measures, but here we are in this real crisis moment and it's a global crisis moment. One of the um, audience members at our April 5th program submitted a question that is very much in line with this. She asks about the specific dangers of this moment, but also about opportunities. Do you see opportunities in this moment to work against hate as we are all experiencing this crisis together? Absolutely. And I think that the, uh, and those are the lessons from the people who work in peace building and who work in the field of atrocity prevention and genocide awareness uh, that all of us agree on is that there's always a silver lining and you can't be in the world of any kind of atrocity studies and not believe that humanity has the ability to improve itself and to, to take action to stop greater harm. Uh, and that luckily, by and large, we mostly do, that these uh, genocides are rare events, and there are reasons that they're rare events. And most of the time, you you, you can find that people will rally around uh, preventing the greater harm. Now, uh, it's as I said, I think it's the harder choice to make, but it's the necessary choice to make. So, one of the ways, like if 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 it's okay, I'll talk a little bit about how we can do this in the center that I run. Please, and please do. The uh, so I, look, I'm lucky to teach at West Point, where I do get some of the most idealistic and brightest students in the country. They want to serve. They want to make the world better. So I I will admit that that you have to take some of my comments with a grain of salt because I I have a a, a different population of students than perhaps others will uh, will deal with. But I don't think they're that different. I think that they're uh, they're representative of students. Uh, across the country who really do want to make the world a better place. Uh, and there are lots of people in every organization that you run into who feel the same way. And so what I've found is that as long as I can figure out what uh, inspires that individual, uh, then I can figure out a way to, 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 to lead them to how to think about what the right decision is for them. 
And what we do at West Point is we can do that through courses. We do that through trips, sadly, not right now, uh, but uh, we're still teaching, but we are not actually uh, not, not traveling. Uh, but in a normal year, I'll send cadets to Poland, I'll send them to Rwanda, I'll send cadets to, um, to, uh, to the Czech Republic, to, and they visit to Asian spot, all over the world to try to get this experience of learning about not just what atrocity is, but those people who were critical in overcoming it and in, in coming up with ways uh, methods of reconciliation, of figuring out how to pursue justice, uh, and of dealing with the trauma of uh, of survival and the and understanding those different positions. And so, one of the things that I think we have to do when we, in terms of how we find the silver lining with COVID, is the same way we as academics work uh, on any of these issues. We have to be critical. We have to be honest. We have to assess the situations and be willing to take blame for, for what, we, what mistakes we made. And we need to be able to, uh, to, to think through how decisions often involve trade-offs. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, that I have been forced to teach more of here and at, at West Point than I might have elsewhere that the critique of academics often is you live in, uh, you know, in ivory towers where you can come up with theory and never have to apply it. And because you never have to apply it, you can make it as crazy as you want. Well, uh, not with the students that I teach. The students that I teach will graduate, become officers, and will have to apply this theory in practice immediately, more or less six months after graduation when they start leading troops. And some of my cadets in the past have become um, mayors in towns of, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, more or less at age 23. They have been advisors to general officers in charge of areas in those countries. They've worked in special operations command. They have worked as the, one of my graduates was uh, a quick story. I, I did a question and answer with uh, on atrocity in the Middle East with David Petraeus back in 2015. And I had a 2014 grad who I invited back and she had just arrived in Kuwait and she went to her, com her commander and said, I, you know, I, I need some time. I need a pass to be able to go to this event. And commander looked at her and said, you're a second lieutenant. Why is it that David Petraeus wants you in an event? And, uh, and so she came back. Well, first she told him the story of the courses that she had taken with me on, um, and her interest in human rights and, uh, the work that she had done on genocide. And he said, when you get back, you're going to be my human rights advisor for, um, for this area that we're working on in the Middle East. So as a second lieutenant, this is the kind of impact that they can have. Uh, that's an example of how we, we do things a little bit differently. We, the, my, my students continue to be my students well after they, uh, they graduate and we continue to stay in touch. Uh, we continue to work. Some of them I bring back. Uh, in fact, one of the questioners was one who is uh, finishing up her degree in, uh, at Duquesne. She's finishing a master's. She's actually got everything done, but the dissertation. And her work is on Rwanda, uh, the UN, the US, and identity politics and identity formation in the 1950s and the late colonial period. And that kind of knowledge, she's going to come back and teach at West Point, and she's going to be here for three years. Then she'll go back out into the regular army, and she'll bring those lessons back to the regular army. And hopefully we'll continue to, uh, to correspond, work together. And, uh, and create new opportunities for a new sets of leaders in the armed forces who better understand the, uh, the problems and the trade-offs involved with atrocity prevention and the need for it. I, I find it so interesting that the center that you run at West Point has this specific role to play in the world. It's, it's different 
from other academic centers for Holocaust and genocide studies, exactly because you're putting people out into the field. And um, if I'm understanding correctly, you also consult to other branches of the military and to the government of the United States. So can you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like? Sure. So um, some of the things that, I, uh, that I've done is, uh, I'm not sure your audience is familiar, but there's something called the Atrocity Prevention Board. Uh, this was stood up by President Obama, and its purpose was to bring together about uh, an, every national security agency, so everyone from the Defense Department to CIA to the Treasury Department, so that the right hand knows what all the other left hands are doing, and that we have a coordinated response to potential atrocities around the world. And this is an, uh, an interagency organization that does not get a lot of, um, a lot of credit. It doesn't, it's, uh, it's meeting far less often than the current ad administration, but it still is in theory existent and it works through the National Security Council. And it, 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 its purpose is to kind of bring attention to areas of the world that a year or two out have the distinct possibility of being in crisis. And that way we have the time to take uh, preventative action and to come up with a coordinated plan to do so. And so I've worked a little bit with the Office of the Secretary of Defense, uh, who representatives who have served on, on that committee. Uh, I work with Homeland Security. I've done uh, annual human rights training for their investigation group in New York. Uh, I've worked with the State Department on different programs where, in fact, we've involved our cadets in systems engineering. So something that I know very little about, but I have colleagues who are interested in taking projects that the State Department needs done and helping do them uh, by applying some of the undergraduate principles that they're learning uh, at West Point. So I, everything that I try to do, I try to incorporate cadets or active military in the process. I've, uh, what else have we done? Um, we do work, uh, one of my main purposes is to work with the other service academies. And so uh, for many years, I've also partnered with the Holocaust Museum, and we've done something called the Mass Atrocity Education Workshop, where we bring together faculty from the different service academies and help develop courses or course content, often around themes, um, like gender or geography and bring people from particular departments, but mix them and uh, try to get them to develop materials. And so the outcome of one of those was something we call Ordinary Soldiers, which is a case study uh, of a German army regiment. And that now is being used in other outreach. So for example, that's being used by the ROTC. ROTC is the Reserve Officer Training Corps and it is the organization that oversees the training of cadets uh, in the military at all of the other um, public and private universities that have um, a, a reserve component at their school. So it's another way of commissioning officers. Uh, it's also going to be used at the Swedish Defense University. They're incorporating it into the courses that they have for officership. So these are the, some of the different ways that we do outreach, both to different parts of the U.S. government uh, and to even governments abroad. I think the the more important, the most important thing is it, it goes to all levels of the military education. So the military uh, is a constantly learning organization, and what I mean by that is every time you get promoted, uh, you have to learn the responsibilities of what your next job is. And so when you are a lieutenant, you don't really, you're not, you're, it's not your focus to study what a captain should be doing because you're a lieutenant and you need to know what a lieutenant is doing. When you become a captain, you have to learn what a captain should do. So we send you to schools and those schools are part of what we call the professional military education program. The, at the top end of this is the National Defense University. And just a couple of weeks ago, um, myself and a few colleagues uh, were successful in getting a course adopted at the uh, National Defense University on genocide and atrocity prevention. And so these are the ways that, again, we are influencing, hopefully, a, a whole load of different cohorts who will be able to make an impact um, in this field. And so this would be for senior leaders in the military, colonels, 
uh, and above, then perhaps people, uh, there are people who go to these schools who are the, the senior executive service. So people who are government appointees who, um, who are at the level of normally um, one star equivalent. So the equivalent of an admiral or the equivalent of a general, and they're running uh, subsets of organizations of other parts of the, the government, and they come and they can also take this course. So we're very excited about that, and hopefully that's going to make a real difference. To me, this is the note of optimism that I was hoping that we would hear because that, mm -hmm. uh, that you're getting this content to um, people at all levels, working in the government, working in the military, not only in this country, but abroad as well. And to have people in positions of power who have had this training in atrocity prevention and have this background, that is a very hopeful, hopeful idea. And, mm -hmm. and I, hope that, I hope that we'll see the results of that. The Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh does a training with police recruits. That's, mm -hmm. We always talk about acting at our level. We heard about that from Father Patrick Dubois, and we believe very mm -hmm. strongly in that idea. Our, our level here is we can work with the police. Mm -hmm. And it's been a really productive relationship. Um, the police officers we work with are really involved in the community anyway, so there's a warm <laughs> relationship. But it allows us to teach things that we understand and know from what we know about the Holocaust that mm -hmm. certainly have echoes and reverberations now. We can learn from them. And I'm, I'm really inspired and excited to hear about what you're able to do from West Point and also excited that because we're recording this conversation, other people will hear about it and will know about it because I don't think it's something that's widely known and understood. So, well, I'm grateful for that. Thank you. That's, it's really exciting to me. So I want to get to some other questions that came from the Q&A from the April 5th program. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you've already spoken to this a little bit, but um, kind of around it, you know, there's a, the new Never Again um, mm -hmm. Act that was passed by the House of Representatives. Um, how can leaders like you help to operationalize what the what the House of Representatives has said that we should be doing with Holocaust education? Um, thank you for for that question, and also thank you for what you just said because I think that that uh, the only place you can actually be inspired is at your level. Right? That that that's where you have to start, and uh, I think the 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 part that uh, that I enjoy most is that. Um, is, is making that level big, right? And finding a way to, uh, to, to not be constrained by someone saying, oh, that's probably above your pay grade. That uh, being able to push out and to, to hear, and I think um, we had Patrick Dubois come and speak, and we had him speak not just about uh, the, what he has seen both in uh, Ukraine and the work he did in Ukraine and Belarus, and uh, and in um, in Iraq, where he Iraq, worked at the right. Yazidi, uh, that was. Uh, but but also talk about post traumatic stress, uh, because that's something that uh, that his his staff that he uh, had suffered through, and it's really important for for my folks to realize that it's not just the military that get that, but that the military's experience with it is very similar to those who are. Who are exposed to trauma, who experience trauma, and once you kind of open up that line, then then your level expands, right? Then you are able to talk to uh, to across boundaries of groups of people and get them to work together, similar to ways that uh, some of the programs to deal with uh, with post traumatic stress involve theater, involve uh, all kinds of different mechanisms that aren't the first things that military officers think about. And uh, nor are they the first things that people in other fields who are experiencing, they, they don't think to always make that connection to, um, to the military. And so I try to do that also with cadets by allowing them to utilize whatever their creative talents are. So I've had cadets write graphic novels. Um, as you might imagine, there aren't a lot of drawing. There's no art, <laughs> no art classes at West Point. And, uh, and there are very few... Uh, classes that would allow for the kind of uh, the the use of creative visual abilities, and so when I offered the opportunity to cadets to uh, to write 
graphic novels about Holocaust or genocide related subjects, they've jumped at it. And I've had some one write about the um, the Al Anfal campaign, Saddam Hussein's campaign of gas against the Kurds in the late eighties. Uh, I had another write about the um, the Kastner train and the uh, this whole ethical question about uh, about paying for the release of some people uh, but not others and getting into uh, those sorts of, of very difficult questions and so to get back to this question about the um, the never again act I think that's a difficult question as easy as it seems and what I mean by that is it's great when Congress passes uh, some of these some of these acts that uh, last year we also passed the Ellie Wiesel uh, Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention Act, or now law. Uh, but when they're not resourced, uh, they can be secondary priorities. And with the example of the, the Never Again Act, I think it's great, uh, but to some extent, we're already doing that. The, the impact might, uh, of that act is going to be felt well outside of the, of the military. Uh, the military has long been working with the Holocaust Museum in D.C., in large part because the Holocaust Museum in D.C., as a federal agency, has a specific task to work with the U.S. government, both military and civilian, on Holocaust issues. And so that's why they do programs similar to yours with police. Uh, that's why they do programs with, with, uh, with the FBI, with, um, with judges and why they work very closely and have worked very closely with, with me. They've been my, ba my greatest partner, and uh, the center at West Point really would not exist if it didn't have that partnership. Uh, we Every year we bring three groups of cadets to, or every year except for this one, we bring right. three groups of cadets to D.C. for different types of programming. One is kind of a, a, a one-day introduction to the Holocaust where they get the opportunity to meet a survivor and go through the exhibits and have some critical discussions about what they see. Uh, that normally we, we, we have for students who are what we call plebes or who are freshmen. Uh, we then have a program that's related to a course that I teach, the Holocaust course, and a, um, we have a law of war course at West Point, uh, which can make some sense. And we bring my students and some students from that Law of War course, and we have a program on the Nazis, their use of law, uh, the legal profession, and then war crimes. And that's a two-day program. And then late in the spring, normally right after the day of uh, the Week of Remembrance, we will have a program called the Joint Service Academy's Mass Atrocity Prevention Symposium. Uh, that's a mouthful, but what it is, is we bring students from all of the service academies, from Air Force, from Coast Guard, from Navy, and from West Point, and we, uh, we solicit them in advance. They send abstracts of work that they've done on atrocity-related issues. We create panels. We bring them down. They present their work to each other. And they also hear from experts in the field. So people from parts of government or from NGOs like Amnesty or, um, or Civic or other organizations that are working on atrocity prevention. And so we have this mix of professionals, scholars, and, uh, and inspired undergraduates who are presenting their work. And, uh, and that's been a great success. So that combination of programs happens at the museum because the museum provides a fantastic venue, as I'm sure your work it provides a, an incredible venue for the students in, um, in Pittsburgh. And so getting them there so that they can experience that, and that, that's how you build inspiration, and that's how you get them involved and further involved. And if I could tell a short story about uh, one example, uh, one of my cadets in, uh, let me think, in 2014, uh, she was a plebe, and she went on this trip, the, the, the one-day introduction uh, trip. She came, I always give a little talk after saying, if this kind of thing interested you, or if you are further inspired by this, come and see me, and we'll talk about what else you can do. 
And she came to me and she said, I want to do something. And I said, okay. And she said, I want to hold a conference at West Point. And I said, all right, that sounds good. But I also know that there is a, um, a great student at Navy who actually might want to work with you and maybe we could do something for the whole academy or for the academies. And so that's the origin of that joint service academy program. Ah. Uh, so the three students who put this together, one ended up winning a Truman. The other ended up being the first and the one who I'm talking about ended up being the first African-American woman to ever be first captain at West Point. And she's currently a finishing her second year of her Rhodes Scholarship. And the third was a Schwartzman Scholar, uh, a, a family who emigrated from Haiti and, uh, and won and this scholarship to go and uh, study in, in China for a year. And so that's the kind of, of, of caliber that we get, but that's also the, the, the inspiration and the way that this kind of structured opportunity provides that if we can get them when they are are just starting and then build on that the Simone for example the one who is finishing the Rhodes scholarship she did her um, her first master's in Oxford on forced migration and now she's doing another one on international politics and development and positioning herself essentially to work in atrocity prevention as a career and so these are the kinds of, of, of students that we can that we can produce, and uh, it's just a matter of figuring out how to catch their attention. I guess that's the, and and so there are positives and there are things that can be done. Well, it's incredible because you're you're painting a picture of a very structured program, but with enough flexibility for students to be creative and inspired and and make really significant things happen. So that's that's so exciting. And getting back to some questions that we got from back on April 5th, because there were a lot of questions about what students can do. And mm -hmm. at the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, mostly we're in teacher training and increasingly now working directly with students. And mm -hmm. we find that there is so much power and potential in letting students take the wheel. Mm -hmm. So, um, so we had a couple of questions. Um, one is more for families, but we're getting back to thinking about this particular moment and let's let's get back to never again mm -hmm. um, so I want to save one question for I thought I was saving my never again question for last but I've changed my mind so we have a question from a woman who works with echoes and reflections someone that um, David Estrin and I know well from our work with the Association for Holocaust mm -hmm. organizations um, I'll, I'll read it in its entirety um, and Melissa Mott thank you for the question um, where some people see apathetic or digitally consumed me generation, I see young people galvanized for a more just and equitable world. What are your thoughts on youth action? How do young people play into what never again means now in today's world? Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think that what we find is that it's easy to, to uh, sometimes mistake um, what I would say is a tepid first reaction for apathy. Uh, and I think that if we do, then that's on us. Then the, the, the way you, you essentially I'll put it this way, if you win converts to, to this kind of thinking is that you, you are not afraid to bring it up again and again. And, uh, and one of the things that I find uh, most effective in how I've taught is to teach about identity. And I think that what you were describing and allowing students to kind of choose their own way and to take the reins is because they can relate to it personally. Now, there are obvious dangers from an, a kind of a scholarly perspective. You don't want someone's small experience to be potentially related to the, uh, you know, the decimation of a population. Uh, but at the same time, there needs to be that personal investment in order for, for someone to say, I'm willing to pursue this further. And they need to see connections between their lived lives and, uh, and why something is important. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to them. And uh, I see that with um, the best way to kind of go about this is to be honest and to not sugarcoat and to talk about the direct connections to, to their lives. Uh, to talk about their lives, to get them to talk about their lives. 
for me, it's incredibly easy to talk about identity formation. I have a whole course on race, ethnicity, nation, and gender. And uh, it's in- incredibly easy to teach at an institution like West Point, where we actively build an identity. We take students, we say, hey, okay, you were just like your normal run-of-the-mill everybody else yesterday, and now today you're going to be an army officer and you have to have a whole set of values, a whole kind of behavior, a whole uniform, a whole haircut, everything, everything changes. Uh, So there's a, a physical and intellectual construction of identity. And many of those techniques are exactly the same techniques that can be exploited by bad actors. And being able to explain that to them and get them to see, oh, okay. And so and I love talking, for example, um, we have a big bonfire before we play our football game against Navy. We burn an old ship of some form, some old wooden ship. And so I, I asked them, why do we do that? Like, uh, and they start to see that, and then I show them torchlit mm-hmm. parades, uh, and I and they see the links, and it makes sense to them all of a sudden, and they see the negatives of that can come with the uh, the, the the focus on group or the absolute focus on group, uh, and they see how groups are involved with creating in and out groups. And, uh, and inclusion and exclusion. So the, the those concepts become really material very easily, uh, or very uh, it's very easy to make them um, very tangible to uh, to my cadets. So explaining that to them is is one thing, and then figuring out, as I mentioned before, how to take advantage of their talents and their uh, their abilities and their interests is the second part of. Um, how do we inspire young people to play a role in Never Again? And uh, sometimes it might be through art, through novels. Other times it might be through service. I'll I'll provide a, another another example. I uh, I'm always, I'm like a proud father. I love to um, in fact I am a proud father, but I love to brag about the cadets. Uh, one of my uh, former cadets who graduated in 2019 actually just finished ranger school uh, a couple days ago uh, so he was spent three months in the mountains in the woods in the swamps uh doing uh, pretty incredible things really testing physical limits and he in that process he did an interview for a fulbright scholarship to um to the uk they pulled him out just for a couple hours so that he could do that and he won it and didn't know until he finished on um, on Sunday, and so uh, so so he was. I knew before him, and uh, he's going to go. He's actually a joint physics and history major, so a double major. He joined the engineer branch, and he's going to study humanitarian engineering so with a focus on demining uh in uh at the university of warwick in england and so the again figuring out what is this person interested in and how can we get that person to do work that contributes to atrocity prevention or conflict prevention is uh is that's where i feel like it's not fair of us to basically say hey you young person you just don't get my message I got to figure out different ways of saying it and different forms of, um, of bottling it, so to speak, so that they can uh, get the message and that it does appeal to them on their terms. And one thing that we have happening now through this month of programming for Genocide Awareness Month is now we have a youth action board that is students, high school students across the United States, and they have been producing programs during the month of programming which began with name readings and now have extended to really a number of very meaningful programs. And that's a a student driven effort. Mm -hmm. So, and again, this is such a strange time, but it's also a time of incredible opportunity because we're all communicating the way that we're communicating right now um, Mm -hmm. rather than in person. So a student north of Pittsburgh now can easily connect to a student in Indiana who's working on something similar and cares about Mm -hmm. the same things. And so we have this chance to make connections in a way that we never could have would have before. 
And so now yeah. we're doing these programs that are being watched by people all around the world. Whereas before we would have had a meaningful group, uh, you know, a program for 500 where people would have made meaningful connections, maybe. I mean, this way I'm, I'm looking at you, you're very close to me through the screen, much closer than you would be on the stage with hundreds of people. And um, that's feedback we've gotten from our programs this month. So talk about silver linings. I think we're finding out um, just an interesting way to feel more connected through technology than we would have before all of this happened. Um, I, have, I have one more question that came from our audience on April 5th that I wanna ask you, um, which is also a COVID-19 question. Um, with COVID-19, many people and families being at home have more time or are doing homeschooling. So this gets us back to young people. Um, what would each, what this is, I'm sorry, this is a question I need to rephrase. Um, what would you recommend for book, film, or other media to engage adults and children during this time? It's also an opportunity for these intergenerational conversations mm -hmm. that maybe don't mm -hmm. happen as much as they could when we're in school or not at home with the family unit so much. So recommendations for books, film, or other media to engage in. Uh, yeah, and this is the question that actually came from our from from my the my student who I'm bringing back, who I'm very excited uh, will be teaching at West Point. Uh, and I well, know thank you for the question. Thank you to her for the question. Yeah, and I know she 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 asked that on on behalf of someone else who uh, and I would actually refer them back to you in that the my area of expertise is not primary and secondary education and the. Uh, in this field where the the material is really difficult you you can't expose a uh, an eight-year-old to the same material that you would expose a 16 year old and the, even the 16 year old perhaps you might want to stage some of the material that you see when you're age 24 and so uh i think you mentioned <coughs> excuse me facing history you mentioned that goes in reflections uh your center the, there are multiple universities that actually do a lot of teacher training and produce mm -hmm. materials for, uh, and as well as um, as other museums uh, in New York. We have the uh, um, we have the, the Museum of Jewish Heritage. They all produce materials that can be used in schools. Uh, Stockton University Chap uh, in New Jersey, Chapman University out in Southern California. They all have these programs for teacher training, and they actually also produce. Uh, material for uh, for different age groups. In some cases, uh, young adult fiction or young adult uh, versions of survivor stories, for uh, for example. That we don't do uh, at West Point, but those are the suggestions that I would have. Is that I'll be I'll, I'll be I'll act like a doctor. I'll give you a referral to the experts uh, <laughs> and to the people who should uh, who are better prepared to answer that question. Uh, that said, I agree with you that the context now provides us with an opportunity to to have discussions that uh, we wouldn't otherwise have. We, uh, I would imagine that uh, that I'm not the only family having more time for family dinners and more opportunity to actually sit and talk. Uh, and in, in, if we think of this as almost found time, right, that, uh, that this is not what we were expecting. And so rather than think of it as lost time, think of it as time to, to do these, to have these conversations and have difficult conversations um, about the future that we, that, that can draw on the past and some of these lessons that, uh, that this is why we read names. This is why we, uh, we have these commemorative events and why we have monuments, memorials, museums, all of these things are meant to remind us uh, to prepare us to better tackle questions in the future by utilizing the lessons of the past. So um, you've, you've sort of thrown a lob. Now I need to hit it out of the park. Um, <laughs> th thank you for what you said about age appropriateness of content, because mm -hmm. this is something that we think about a lot and we work with some teachers who are concerned about should they be teaching about the Holocaust? There are a lot of materials that are made specifically for specific age groups. So at the Holocaust Center, we produce a series of comic books meant for grades six through 12. They read well for adults too. It's Chutzpah Superheroes of the Holocaust. It is true stories from the Holocaust. No one has superpowers. 
Um, they're told like vignettes, so each volume has a number of stories. And we also have an educator's resource guide that goes with that, that you know, enhances the content, defines terms. Um, we have a number of resources that go around that. And we have a book that the Holocaust Center published more than 20 years ago now that is vignettes written by Holocaust survivors. That's a little <laughs> bit more advanced. Um, we also now are gathering digital resources through our website. So anyone can go to our website and see what's available online that might be useful for parents at home, also for teachers. Um, we have a lot of work going on through the Light Educational Initiative, which started in Pittsburgh. All of these resources I'm mentioning we'll be able to share when we share this inter interview. So um, as for younger students, you know, say um, elementary aged, there are things that we can teach about that are not specifically the Holocaust, mm -hmm. um, but concepts that will help later when students are learning the specifics of the Holocaust. It is very difficult subject matter, and you know we abide by the principle of gently in and gently out. We don't teach about the Holocaust um, to scare children. <laughs> we've, we've been accused of that. It's not mm -hmm. what we're doing at all. Um, we really believe that knowledge of the Holocaust is is a powerful tool in improving the present and the future. And we've heard that from you in all of your responses about what you're doing at West Point and what a wonderful resource you have there. And I'm grateful to you for coming back to talk to us again after we didn't have time to get into the questions. Do you have any concluding thoughts, anything I didn't ask you that you'd like to talk about? Well, I would uh, echo what you just said about the, uh, the the need to engage, but I also would add that uh, that I found that there is a that the stomach of young people is actually stronger than we give them credit for, that they are willing to engage these topics and that they uh, they're able to to absorb more at a younger age than we perhaps think that uh, well, than we we might assume, and the in doing so I I think. What you said with the use of comic books, the uh, the different kinds of media that we're now using, that reminds me of a point that I wanted to make, which is that uh, that we're doing something similar, uh, not only giving cadets the opportunity to to do these kinds of graphic novels, but at the same, also with the materials that we're developing, creating interactive and digital uh, materials. And so I I think I mentioned during the uh, the April fifth event that we're we're doing something with Romeo Dallaire and his leadership in Rwanda during the Rwandan genocide and so it's a study on character and leadership and at uh, at the within the militaries we we put a lot of credence into character the idea that if you are have the right ideas and the right values you will make the right decision and uh, I'm not always sure that that's the case that there that Part of the problem that most people face in their lives is that uh, their principles become compromised for some reason, and the, there are always all of these extraneous factors pulling and pushing on them, uh, and you can have all of the right character attributes, yet none of the ability to actually make the right decision. And so we put a case study together about the decision-making of Dallaire in Rwanda, so that uh, military officers can look at what happens when you don't have the support from your higher command, you don't have the troops you need to accomplish your mission, you don't have the rules of engagement necessary to do what you want. Uh, and so how do you make the right decision in those circumstances where there is no right decision, someone gets hurt no matter what you do. And so engaging with that kind of uh, of Thinking, I think uh, while it's uh, it can be criticized as practical and, uh, and and not idealistic enough, it actually is what allows us to kind of put more meat on the concept of never again. That if we want to think of never again simply as an aspiration, that's great, but we also have to think of how you practically apply it and uh, and. Thinking in terms of the trade-offs and of the, the harms that actions cause, not just the hope that hack action will solve a problem, will get us to better move towards figuring out what actions are best as opposed to what actions uh, or inactions are, are worse. 
And so I wanted to just raise that we're putting that material online as well as soon as that's done. So you'll have an ability to, to take a look at that. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to, to share some of those links. Well, I will look forward to that and to seeing it and to be able to share it when the time comes. And I want people who are watching this to know that we have tried twice now to bring Professor Fry to Pittsburgh. And for various reasons, it hasn't happened yet. But I hope that before okay. too long, we will meet in person. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. And I'm just I'm really looking forward to sharing everything that we talked about because I do believe that it will be many things that people are generally not aware of. And, and I'm just excited to tell people more about what you're doing at West Point and this message of hope for the future that is, that is your students. So thank you. And thank you for, for what you do and for this opportunity. I really appreciate it.